The Tom Woods Show, episode 1925. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, don't even think about missing the libertarian event of the year, the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, live in Orlando, featuring many of your favorites from The Tom Woods Show. And Michael Malice says his special surprise guest, whose identity I myself don't even know, will bring the house down. Cost nothing to attend. Register at TomWoods2000.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm joined today by Peter McCormick, who has a very interesting podcast called What Bitcoin Did. And we're going to talk Bitcoin a bit today. We've got a number of news items to talk about. First, the interesting development in El Salvador, then ongoing difficulties with China. I want to continue on the discussion about electricity because Senator Elizabeth Warren lectured us about the importance of fighting climate change by cracking down on cryptocurrencies, particularly on Bitcoin miners. So let's get all that stuff out of the way. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. It's uh, it's an honor to be here. You're a really interesting guy, and I'm really impressed with how successful your podcast is. I mean, obviously, interest in Bitcoin continues to grow, but it's still, you know, it's still kind of a niche thing. It's not something like fashion or weight loss, you know, where you're going to have hundreds of millions of potential audience members. I mean, someday, someday for crypto. Maybe. But what you've done is very, very impressive. You have a, a very substantial social media following. And what's also interesting about you is you show that not everybody in the Bitcoin world is an ideological libertarian. I mean, you strike me as more philosophically eclectic, and I absolutely welcome that. I I want the whole world to be libertarian, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think it's great for the Bitcoin world to be that way because then I think it turns people off. It makes them think, oh, this is some libertarian thing. I'm not into that. Well, yeah, I mean, not every libertarian is a ideologically a Bitcoiner. Uh, right. It kind of works both ways. And do you know what the funny thing is, Tom? I mean, look, I'm a big fan of your show and you've had some of the smartest Bitcoiners on there. You've had my friend VJ Boyaparty on and Jameson Lop and various other people. Yeah. My podcast really, it's all one, one big, just giant accident. I set it up about four years ago. I'm not the smartest Bitcoiner. I don't have an economics or technological background. I've got an advertising background. So everything I've done is by chance, but I've kind of drifted into your world because there are a lot of libertarian Bitcoiners. So it has really shifted my thinking because before I started the podcast, before I discovered Bitcoin, I'd never heard of libertarians. I didn't even know what it was. So this is all new to me. Hmm. Well, that now that's quite interesting. And I wonder if we could start actually by talking about something from your own personal history that I wonder if maybe it influenced your thinking. I heard something from a third party about your bank canceling your account and had something to do with Bitcoin. Is that right? Yeah. So, gosh, this was uh, about three months ago. I got a phone call from my bank, uh, Lloyd's, and they just wanted to do an account review. And I said, yeah, fine. They said, well, we wanted to know what some of these payments are for. And I was like, okay. So they listed off some payments and they were ones that went to Bitcoin exchanges. And I just said, look, this is none of your business. I'm, I'm not telling you this. This is this is my choice. You know, I'm an adult. I've got two children. I'm 42 years old and I'm responsible for my own money and life. I don't really need to tell you. I mean, the the main problem here is that the UK government and, uh, you know, financial crimes division of the UK police have outsourced surveillance to the banks. So they are tracking any form of large amounts of payment or irregular payments, which means we've lost all forms of financial privacy. But I said, no, it's none of your business. And Two weeks later, after being with them for 25 years, four bank accounts, you know, no debts, no every loan or mortgage, always paid on time. They gave me six weeks notice and closed down my bank account, which was shocking without warning. They had their reasons. But, you know, so for me, it was a real kind of, it was a real moment for me in understanding the role of the state and also a real moment for me in, you know, further entrenching my position with Bitcoin. Yeah, I hadn't known I heard that story from a person who wrote to me and said, hey, why don't you have this guy on your show? Oh, wow. And then I heard that story and I thought, well, that sounds like exactly the kind of guy I want to have on my show. But I know that you are what they call, would you describe yourself as a Bitcoin maximalist, so to speak? Um, look, I'm very 
close to it. I'm not 100% Bitcoin maximalist. There's this thing called Monero, which I find interesting and, and I don't completely dislike. I also recognize part of the Bitcoin ecosystem runs on, you know, it's supported by stable coins, which run on other blockchains. So it's very difficult to be 100% Bitcoin when you know that certain people need stable coins, which maybe run on Ethereum to be able to trade Bitcoin. But I mean, look, I'm, it's the only one I care about, really. It's what my podcast is about. It's what I've dedicated my life to. So I would say I'm very close. Well, I want to ask you, even though this is, I guess, a kind of an internal Bitcoin question, but I do want to say before we get to some of the other topics that as an outside observer, I mean, not really outside, like I'm very pro Bitcoin, but I don't have a podcast about Bitcoin. I don't write about it a lot. So I'm kind of an outsider. I'm just observing how people who really have devoted themselves to it talk about these kinds of issues. And I know, like for example, when I recently did my interview with VJ about his new book, mm -hmm. I love VJ. I've known him for a long time. I'm a huge supporter of what he does. But yet in the comments section of that interview, I had a lot of people saying, well, why didn't you talk about the fact that these days you really don't use Bitcoin for actual purchases, like day-to-day -day purchases, small purchases, the fees and the delays would be overwhelming. And so that is the complaint of the people who are in so-called Bitcoin cash. Now, I have seen some of the most vicious, uncharitable exchanges between BTC and BCH people imaginable over this thing and each accusing the other of the worst possible treachery. But the fact is, I know that, you know, Bitcoin is more popular and has more defenders than Bitcoin Cash. I get that. But it's not like the points they're raising are out of left field. When Bitcoin was sold to me, it was sold on the grounds that it's something that can facilitate transactions with almost no fee. That was the thing that was... So it's not like these people are coming along in the ninth inning with some unreasonable complaint at the last minute. That is exactly what I was told. And now I feel like it's turned into a bait and switch and when people come along and say, this is a problem, they get savaged. And, and I'm just going to say for the record, mm. I like Roger Veer. Okay, so come at me, all you Bitcoin people. Come at me. I like him personally. He's the guy who turned me on to Bitcoin all these years ago. I like him. I don't think he's a shyster. I think his heart is absolutely in it. I think this is a completely legitimate, good faith disagreement. Now, convince me otherwise. Well, there's a few things to unpack here. Firstly, it's kind of funny. The first time I ever listened to your show is when you hosted the debate between Jameson Lopp and Roger Veer. And, and that, that was, was in, wasn't that wasn't that the most civil debate we've heard on this topic? Yeah, I mean, you moderated it very well. But I was at a time there where I was a bit unsure on the block size debate. And I was very much convinced by Jameson Lopp after that one. And look, Roger Veer created Bitcoin Cash. And, you know, he has become out of favor with the Bitcoin crowd. But you know, controversially, I, I don't mind the guy for a couple of reasons. He really supported the Ross Ulbrich legal costs. He was very generous towards Ross's mom and helping with that. And also, like nobody knows this, it's the first time I've ever told anyone, I'm in a, a legal situation at the moment with a chap called Craig Wright. You know, Roger offered me a lot of money to support that without wanting anything in return. There was no request for an interview or support him. He just wanted to help me. So look, he has some good things about him. I do personally see Bitcoin Cash as an attack on Bitcoin. And I think this war is between people who've become ideologically entrenched. But you have to go to first principles and think about how are you going to build a financial system? And you really have to separate what is the transactional layer from what is the settlement layer. To build it all on a single layer doesn't make any sense. No financial system in the world is all built on a single layer. So when people say that Bitcoin is too slow or too expensive, what they're actually talking about is using what is the settlement layer for day-to-day -day transactions. Now, Tom, I've just been out in uh, El Salvador, and I was there using the Lightning Network, which is the transactional layer for Bitcoin. And I've been buying cups of coffee and pupusas, and those transactions have been settling instantly and at a very low cost, you know, faster sometimes and cheaper than using Visa. So I think most of the times it just comes down to people like, who are either misinformed or ideologically entrenched. But if you just go down to first principles about how you build one of these systems, you of course need to separate the settlement layer from the transactional layer. You mentioned El Salvador, so let's jump into some of these topics. That was a major news item. So is it, if I'm understanding this correctly, is it that El Salvador declared Bitcoin to be legal tender, which kind of puts it on even keel with other currencies? Yeah, I mean, they're a dollarized country. 
prior to the bill being passed, the dollar was the legal tender in the country. Now they've added Bitcoin, so they now essentially have two legal currencies. And what's going to happen? They've got a 90-day program to roll this out. And one of the key parts of the bill was that every economic agent is legally obliged to accept Bitcoin. Now, some of the people have complained about this, said this is unfair, but what the government has done, they've put in place a fund to support economic agents so they don't actually have to keep the Bitcoin. If they're worried about volatility or they don't like the asset, they have to accept it, but that can be instantly converted into the dollar. So you say you recently spoke to the president of El Salvador about this? Yeah. I mean, I've been going out there for two years now. And once I heard about the bill, I reached out to one of the brothers and said, come on, let me do the interview. And the president said, yes. So I went out there about nine days ago. I was in New York. I flew there nine days ago. I had a meeting with the president, talked about the interview I wanted to do. And then, you know, I think it was, what, four or five days ago, I sat down with him. We did an interview that was just over an hour long, and that was released today. So what are your impressions? Why? It just seems like such a an out-of-the-blue decision to make. It's one that we favor, but what do you think motivated it? Well, a couple of things. It seems out of the blue, but I think they've been looking at Bitcoin for quite some time. Look, they face an issue being a dollarized country, and especially over the last year during the pandemic. I I can't remember the number. You might know, Tom, but something like 40% of all dollars have been printed in the last year, and that is debasing the currency. And what is happening is... You know, inflation is increasing. I think the CPI figure for May was 5%. Jerome Powell is expecting inflation to stay relatively high. So what's happening is that is making goods for people in El Salvador more expensive, but they're not receiving any stimulus checks. Those stimulus checks aren't reaching El Salvador. So that's a problem when you don't control the currency. Yes, it's great. They've had a stable currency for the last 20 years, which is usually a problem in South America and Central America. But at the moment, the currency is being debased. And I see this as a move whereby the president, you know, he's a young guy. He he recognizes things like social media and the trends and things are moving. He recognizes what's happening with Bitcoin. He recognizes this is a currency that people want to use. He recognizes that this is an opportunity to bring economic freedom and, you know, human freedom to his country and maybe drive prosperity. But also, Tom, one of the other really interesting aspects of this is the remittance side of things. And this is a global issue. But El Salvador alone, 15% of the GDP is remittance from Salvadorans in America sending money back to their home country. And there's a couple of issues. Firstly, remittance isn't always direct and instant to your phone. You sometimes have to go to Western Union, which is dangerous. And there's also high remittance fees. But by using a technology such as Bitcoin or even there's an application called Strike built by Jack Mallers that uses the Bitcoin network to send synthetic dollars, What that actually does is that allows instant and free remittance. So what happens is rather than being having to go to the Western Union, you can be sat on your couch and you can receive money directly from somebody in the US for free. So that's going to raise the GDP of the country. That's going to enable people to send smaller transactions, you know, two, three, four, five dollars if they want. And that's also going to put more money and the hands of the people in El Salvador. So there's so much opportunity for the country using the Bitcoin network that I think he recognized this. And and now he's really pushed down the first domino and other countries are considering this too. Well, that's a bit of good news. But then Mm. countering that is apparently news out of China that seems to put downward pressure on Bitcoin having to do with Bitcoin mining. So to what extent is Chinese government policy going to be a depressing force on Bitcoin? Well, listen, this is seen by some people as bad news. I actually see it as good news. We're always under this threat that China is banning Bitcoin. They seem to ban it every year in some way or another. And also, a lot of people complain that the mining side is centralized and is all in China. What's now happening is with these mines closing down, this is going to increase the opportunity for other miners to increase their revenue from mining because there's less competition. And so some of these Chinese miners will move to other territories, And some people who are already based in other territories are going to grow their minds. And there's so much opportunity now in the rest of the world. We've got these geothermal opportunities with volcano mining in El Salvador. We've got hydroelectric power coming out of Paraguay, where people can co-locate their mines there. So really, all this is going to do is this is a temporary change in the hash rate. Ultimately, this is going to lead to a more decentralized mining infrastructure for Bitcoin. Hey, everybody. Let's thank our sponsor, Skillshare. Over the years, you guys have heard me interview 
three of my daughters. I'm going to try and get a fourth one to come on here and talk about her experience with Skillshare. We've talked about how my daughters have improved in their creative writing or learned sign language or improved in the arts because of quick, simple classes they took on Skillshare. The old man here has used it to expand his knowledge of marketing and entrepreneurship. It's almost anything you can imagine in the creative realm. You can learn illustration, design, photography, animation, productivity, and more. It's like Netflix. One membership gets you everything they have. And these are classes made for real life. They're not eight months long, five hours a day. They're short to the point, and they teach you a finite, useful skill to help you learn something brand new or expand upon what you already know. Skillshare has classes for every skill level, whether you're a pro or a hobbyist or a master. They've got short lessons, hands-on projects, classes designed for real life. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Woods, where our listeners get a one-month free trial of premium membership. That's one month free at Skillshare.com slash Woods. There's so many things in this short amount of time I want to get your opinion on. Because Bitcoin recently went at least temporarily dipped below 30,000. And for, by the way, it's, it's almost surreal to be having this conversation because mm -hmm. we all were alive. Anybody who would be listening to this conversation was alive during a time when Bitcoin was worth pennies, mm -hmm. you know, or, or a few dollars or a hundred dollars. And here we are saying, well, it dipped below 30 grand for about five minutes. But there are people who observe these kinds of, of trends and they'll say, oh, well, 30,000 is some kind of magic number. Once it tumbles below that, there are a lot more losses coming. What's your opinion of this? Yeah, there's, there's two sides to the volatility on the pricing that we, we need to think about. Firstly, is that if we are talking to people or countries like El Salvador and the, the people who live there about Bitcoin as a you know an opportunity to own an asset and to be protected against the dollar, we also need to explain and educate these people on what the volatility is. You know, Bitcoin over a long time frame, you know as well as I am, Tom, if you can hold a Bitcoin for four years, you're usually in a pretty good position. But over the short time, it can be all over the place. That presents a risk to people. You know, if you need this money to survive or run your business, you should not be holding the majority of your wealth in Bitcoin. But you can put a little bit side, you know, a little bit that you've got extra to save. That's one side of it. The other side of the volatility is that we should expect this. You know, we're going through a, a financial revolution here. We are potentially seeing the rollout of a new global reserve asset. And when you think about that, something that was priced at pennies back in, you know, 10, uh, 11 years ago, that is now, you know, hit a trillion dollars. I know we're under it now, but hit a trillion dollars. And that might go to 10 trillion. It's not going to go in a straight line. You know, there's lots of challenges and complexities around this. We should expect volatility and we should embrace it. So, we should be aware and we should educate about it, but we have to expect this is going to be a volatile asset. Can you tell me what you, your impression is of the way Bitcoin is portrayed in the media? And I ask this because I must have written something about Bitcoin in my newsletter a couple of months ago, and I had somebody write back to me. Now, now, bear in mind, my newsletter, for the most part, over the past year has been entirely about COVID and, and the lockdowns mm -hmm. and issues like that. People have been following me because they're interested in that topic. So I have some people following me who, who are interested in one thing, but they may not agree with me on everything. And so if I write to them about Bitcoin, this is just coming out of left field for them. And most people have been very receptive. In fact, I've had people say exactly that. I started following you because I was interested in COVID and I wanted to get a variety of different perspectives. But I, I'm also now, I'm interested in Bitcoin. Now I'm interested in these other things you talk about. But I had somebody write to me and say, well, Bitcoin is used by drug dealers. And so if that's something that you favor, I have to stop following you. And I thought, <sighs> okay, boom. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I can't believe that's your analysis. <laughs> so, you know, I guess you're going to be getting out of the U.S. dollar real soon, too. Yeah, and you need to get rid of your mobile phone. You need to get rid of Coca-Cola and everything else drug dealers use. Look, this argument's silly, and, and it's silly for a couple of reasons. I'm sure you have a very similar feeling to why on drugs that the war on drugs has failed. It also, who has the right to tell me as a person what to put in my body? The funny thing is, I discovered Bitcoin because of drugs. I discovered it because of the Silk Road. And look, that was my uh, casual use of social drugs. But the really important issue was, you know, in 2017, my mother was dying from cancer and we wanted to get her treatment. We wanted to get her cannabis oil. That's illegal in the UK. We've had people who've been to Holland and brought back drugs for their kids. They brought back cannabis and they've been arrested and had it confiscated, which to me is just an agrarious overreach of the state. You know, this is 
something which it can be a medical treatment. So I had to buy cannabis oil with Bitcoin. So firstly, when they talk about that, I say the problem here is that we've created drug dealers through prohibition. And if you look at the US now, how many states have either decriminalized or made drugs legal, cannabis? You go to somewhere like Colorado now, you know, marijuana is legal. Has society collapsed? No, it's become a professionalized industry and people can go and they can get a professional treatment rather than going behind a waitress, uh, you know, but going behind a, I don't know, I say waitress or Sainsbury's, but maybe a Walmart, somebody you don't know is going to turn up. You don't know what the quality is. You get a much higher quality product. You can go home, you can get stoned and eat your Cheetos and you're not causing any problem. So when they say that, I start from that point. And then after that, also, there's many other issues like you've raised the fact that, well, what else do we ban? Should we ban the US dollar? Because drug dealers use that. Should we ban mobile phones? So really what I think this is, is some people are just very anti-Bitcoin. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. Either they've known about it for a long time, they didn't buy it, or they don't fully understand it. And they're always looking for what can they latch on to to criticize it. We had it recently with Elizabeth Warren making really outdated arguments against Bitcoin's energy usage, or even Elon Musk. And it just, you know, the problem I've got, Tom, I did an interview. You might know Michael Malice. I did an interview with him the other day. I, I might know him. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, he really opened my mind to a few things. And I used to be a defender of journalism, but to me now, it, it's like he said, it's become corporate propaganda. It's lazy. You know, the work that people are doing is they're just latching onto narratives, which are quite frankly untrue. And I'm really fed up of lazy journalists who produce things with weak arguments against Bitcoin. They just haven't done the work. They haven't done the work, and it, you know, really, it does annoy me. But look, we've got people like you and I doing the kind of weird mix of entertainment and journalism, where we can get down to the the roots of the arguments and hopefully present what is the real truth. But you mentioned Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, she made a video that mm. circulated on uh, social media where she said that if we want to make a big dent in the climate change problem, we go after Bitcoin miners. So first of all, again, you're dealing with an audience that. Uh, is very diverse in that I have people who are experts on Bitcoin and I have people who, you know, barely know what it is. So maybe you could say, first of all, what a Bitcoin miner does. And of course, it, it has something to do with the fact that Bitcoin, there's a fixed amount of it that can never be created, mm -hmm. unlike the US dollar. But the Bitcoin mining issue, the energy consumption issue, can you explain? So what is out of date about that? Well, so very, very quick explanation of what Bitcoin mining is. We have a network and we have a ledger. And essentially what the miners do is secure that ledger and they secure that Bitcoin. And they do that by essentially chasing a needle in a haystack. And they are economically rewarded for finding that and securing the network. That's the simplest explanation. You could probably do a whole show on mining itself. The thing is about miners is that they are businesses. And what they do is they buy energy from the energy sector the same way anyone else, either directly from a supplier or from the grid. They are part of the same market that Tesla is to power their gigafactories, part of the same network that Walmart is for powering their stores. They're all part of the same network. But for some reason, people constantly focus on Bitcoin and say, well, the amount of the energy they use, you know, this is egregious. But the point is, is actually, is there anything more important than securing the best form of money the world has ever had? You know, we look at the money printer. The money printer has led to people being pushed into poverty, increasing the, the wealth gap. It's led to wars. It's led to so many terrible things in our society. And what we have now is, you know, an honest form of money, which breaks us apart from the state's money printer. So I think that's a good use of energy. And also, they, Tom, the other thing is they miss out a number of the other key points that a lot of the miners are focused on trying to find the cheapest energy they can. And they are co-locating at the sources of energy and actually using up excess energy to create the most pristine asset that's ever existed. By the way, when I say that, I'm pretty much quoting somebody else, but I, I am doing my best. <laughs> well, incidentally, the um, argument about electricity consumption and all that, as I mentioned in my interview recently with VJ, mm -hmm. whether people making this argument realize it or not, this is drawn almost verbatim from the kinds of arguments that were made against the classical gold standard. Why should we employ all these resources to get gold out of these mines when all we have to do is print the money? So this is just entirely a deadweight loss to society. But as you've indicated, that's a very, very short-sighted way to look at it. We need to look at the big picture. If 
the expenditure involved in getting gold means that there's some check on the government's ability to create money out of thin air. That's money well spent. I agree. Well, listen, look, we all know what's going on here. Bitcoin is a threat. It takes part of the power away from the state. One of my friends, Alex Gladstein, I recently did an interview with him recently about the petrodollar. And what he raised to me was the idea that, you know, a lot of people have questioned why the second Iraq war happened. And he said, well, shortly before that war, Iraq moved to selling uh, their oil for the euro, you know, bypassing the petrodollar. So what we do know that the state is capable of doing some of the most heinous things, committing some of the most heinous crimes to protect themselves. So we look at Bitcoin and that all the state can think is, well, this is an asset that bypasses us. This is an asset that delegitimizes us. This is an asset that makes us you know, less and less relevant. So of course, we're going to try and attack it. And how, what are their tools? Regulation and lies. You know? And what they're doing is they're perpetuating the lies and they're trying to regulate it. But you can't, you can't kill Bitcoin. You can't switch it off. All you quite create now is this regulatory arbitrage. I'm here in the UK with the most stupid laws with regards to Bitcoin. Honestly, Tom, I'm thinking of moving to El Salvador. And if it's not there, it'll probably be Texas. Uh, how about that? Well, first of all, we'd love to have you in the US. I'm a partisan of Florida, but right. we'll, we'll take you anywhere within, uh, within the US. Tell us something about um, your podcast with the intriguing mm-hmm. name, What Bitcoin Did. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, this was all just by chance. I... Uh, I met this guy called Rich Roll. He's a podcaster. He's like this athlete, super vegan athlete. And uh, I just liked his life. And I said, how do you do this? And he, he sent me over to the Pat Flynn course. And I was uh, out in Los Angeles at the time. And I was with my friend Justin saying, you know, I need a name for this. And we was trying to come up with a name. And he said to me, it needs to be about what Bitcoin has done for the world. Like, And I was like, yeah, something about what Bitcoin did. And he was like, yeah, you just call it what Bitcoin did. So there it is. I, I do have a slight regret. Sometimes I think I should have called it the Peter McCormack show because you know sometimes it's nice to have your name as the brand, as you have got it. Yeah, but you know, there are pros and cons to that. When I yeah. originally started this show, I called it the Tom Woods show because I had an existing audience who liked the Tom Woods product. So if I say this is the Tom Woods show, it's my way of saying, here's more of what you already like. True. But then you hit a natural ceiling when you reach, you saturate you know, the audience of people who know who Tom Woods is. So maybe I do wish it had the word liberty or something. But, you know, on the other hand, to heck with it. I'm, I'm glad with it. But, but see, yours, people could stumble upon, and they don't know who Peter McCormick is, but True. gee, that's an intriguing title. Yeah, look, it has served me well. If you search on Google or Apple, if you're interested in Bitcoin, you have got a good chance of stumbling across the show. And, I, you know, I do go into other subjects. I have, as I said, I've interviewed Scott Horton and I've interviewed Michael Malice and Eric Weinstein. So I have started to be able to expand slightly out of just the traditional Bitcoin guest. So it has it has served me well. I mean, I might change the name in the future, but for now, Bitcoin is you know, it's a hot news topic, so I don't need to change it just yet. Well, just podcaster to podcaster, how has your audience responded to that? Have they said, hey, what the heck does this have to do with why I tuned in? Or they say, these are really interesting guests. No, there's been no reaction at all. It's pretty much these are interesting guests. The, the main reaction is, I'll tell you something funny, Tom. So I have this view on podcasts, like these interview podcasts, and I think there's three types. I say there's a smart person, a smart person, a moron, and a smart person, or two morons. And I put myself in the moron and the smart person in that I'm always talking to really smart people. And I think there's an audience for all three podcast types. But what's happened is I've moved into these other people like Eric or Michael, and if hopefully I get to interview you one day, that what happens on the YouTube, I tend to attract new people coming in and they're like, who's this idiot? Why are you talking to this idiot? Uh, but my, <laughs> but my, current, yeah. my current listeners love it because I always try and get the smart people to break things down in an easy to understand way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't, you know, and it's also funny every now and again, although I think this is kind of evened out, but I, I have a libertarian podcast, but from time mm-hmm. to time I have people who are apolitical just they have something interesting to say, or I'll have even people who are not libertarian, but maybe they're left wing or they're they're conservative on some things where you know where they disagree with libertarians. And so sometimes I get people saying, "Hey, it's just a big echo chamber. Why don't you have non libertarians on?" And then I get the non libertarians on, and I get people saying, "Hey, that guy's not a libertarian. What's he doing on your show?" <laughs> you know. So well, I gotta just do what makes me happy. It's called the Tom Woods Show for a reason, and that that's another liberating thing about the Tom Woods Show. It means 
it's not called the Liberty Report. You know, it's not any of that. It's just what's interesting to Tom Woods, which happens to mostly be libertarianism. But if once in a while I want to have a musician on that I really like, then well, <laughs> Doug, you're just going to take it. You're going to like it. Yeah, and now you've got me, someone who's very politically confused. <laughs> But who wouldn't be under the current yeah. circumstances, right? I mean, we have lived through in the past, uh, I don't know how many years, a series of events that would make anybody wonder about you know, what they were taught or which people they're supposed to trust or who's lying to them and who's telling the truth. I mean, who, I mean honestly, who wouldn't be confused? Yeah, I, I am right now. Listen, I, I grew up a socialist, became more conservative, and then through the podcast have been very drawn towards the libertarian and, and the anarchists. So right now, I'm just oh, like, I yeah, know, keep going, Peter. I'm doing it, man. Your instincts are good. We want to lure you over to the dark side. I'm definitely more there now. I, I don't trust corporate media. I, I don't trust the government. I, I no longer have an interest in voting, but I, I've still got like so many things that I question. Now. Yeah, no, no, no. And that, that's that's perfectly fine. No problem with that. But but these are these are very, very important things. I mean, for example, I think a very important principle is when you know in some area that you know something about, like Bitcoin, where you know vastly more than, you know, you may not know as much as, you know, a Jameson DJ. Lop, let's say, but you know way more than uh, some news anchor. And then you see the way the media treats it. And you think, oh my gosh, they are speaking out of unbelievable ignorance and laziness. Mm -hmm. The key next step is, well, wait a minute. If in an area that I know a lot about, I know for a fact they're talking out of there, you know what? Maybe they're talking about their out of their you know what about other things that I don't know anything about. That's the key insight. It's not just going to be uniquely Bitcoin that they're terrible on. But listen, Tom, the world's changing. You know, the interesting thing about me getting the interview with President Bukele, he said at the end off camera, he said to me, "Do you know why I gave you this interview?" Because he could have gone to CNN or Fox or Tucker or you know anyone who would be interested, in, and they would have taken the interview. But he said that would have been boring. You know, they haven't been here. They don't understand it. You know, that's not the world we're in right now. You know, the world we're in right now is podcasts. It is social media. And and that's why I've given it to you, because it needs to be a real interview and real questions. And, you know, Joe Rogan has one of the biggest media properties in the world. It's probably about a five-person company and makes a considerable amount of money. You know, you have what you've got and I've got what I've got. And I, I think we're gradually chipping away at traditional news and traditional media. And I think one of the things that's really helped is COVID. Like I went through a transformation during COVID, right? At the very start, I was very supportive of lockdowns and government because you know, I'm, I have a government Stockholm syndrome. And what I've realized is the absolute stupidity during the process and that's really unlocked a few things in my mind. And I think it's a lot of other people as well. So I think we're just seeing that transition. The likes of you, I, Rogan, Stefan Levera, other people, we're, we're gradually chipping away at this. Well, that's really great to hear. And frankly, it's, it's nice to hear from somebody who has an open enough mind to say, hmm, you know, in light of new observations and evidence, maybe I should rethink my position on, on such and such. That's a in this world where people have just dug in their heels and they're just going to stick to their original position, come what may, you're really a breath of fresh air. What's your website? You have one? Yeah, it's whatbitcoindid.com. You can find me there. And I'm on Twitter all the day, all day tweeting and trolling uh, at Peter McCormack. So if you want to find me, that's where you'll find me. All right, I'll put those both of those links up at tomwoods.com slash 1925. Thanks, mate. Show notes page for today. Well, Peter, I'm glad we connected and me I hope too. this won't be the last time. No, I'd, I'd love to do it again, and I'd love to have you on my show, mate. Okay, both would be great. Thanks again. All right, take care, buddy. All right, everybody, I am recording here while I'm at Porkfest, so I got to get back out there and chit-chat with folks. Wish you could be here. I'm, I've already met a bunch of you just in the first night of being here. If you've never done it before, you got to check out Porkfest. It's an amazing little spontaneous impromptu community that exists for a week every year. And I don't know how to describe it other than you have to see it for yourself. Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.